Hello, everyone. Welcome back to our illusion. In the last video, we learned the basic concepts of parallel computing, and then go through a few basic examples. We showed the speed difference of matrix multiplication between CPU and GPU. Today, we'll use the MVP calculation as the example to learn how to use WebGPU com compute pipeline. And today, our demos run on a new laptop. Although with the integrated graphics card, but it has reached the basic level of an independent GPU. Let's run this test again. We can see the performance of CPU and GPU all have good improvements. The CPU has improved about 10 milliseconds, which is about 30 to 40 percent. And GPU performance is less than 2 milliseconds, which is 8 to 10 times faster. And remember, this is just a low-power integrated graphics card. So for parallel computing, the computational efficiency of the GPU is very high. Now let's take a look at how to use WebGPU for parallel computing. For demonstration, we just remove the code associated with the comparison test and just focus on the WebGPU computing part. First of all, we need to initiate WebGPU. And because we just do the general calculation, no need for the render graphics. So we just need to get this device here, but no need to configure the canvas format, canvas size, or other information. Secondly, as the same as the rendering process, we need to tell the GPU what program to run and the resources required. So here we need to create a pipeline only for the computing pipeline. And we have a dedicated API here, device create compute pipeline. It's similar as the device create rendering pipeline, there are synchronized and synchronized versions. But compared to the render pipeline, the configuration of compute pipeline is much simpler. Basically, we just need one parameter to tell it which shader to run, and an entry function. If there is no special resource layout, then we can use the default layout to auto. And as you can see, we don't have to set up the complicated vertex buffer, configuration information for graphics, depth, templates, and colors. It is very simple to understand. With the pipeline program settled, and we also need some data. And in WebGPU, there are two ways to pass the data, through vertex buffer and bind group. But as for the compute pipeline, there is no vertex buffer. So there is no way to pass data information through vertex buffer anymore. And instead, we can only pass data through band group. The commonly used ones are uniform buffer and storage buffer. The maximum uniform buffer can only be 64 kilobytes. And it is read only in shader. And storage buffer can be very large. It is readable and writable in shader. In the previous rendering pipeline, we have the huge storage buffer. We usually update the buffer through JavaScript. But for the compute pipeline, the writable operation of a storage buffer will be very important. Because in render pipeline, the whole drawing process is handled by the underlying API. And we don't need to worry about the internal data transfer. The final output will be the pixel color. But in compute shader, we need to process the data ourselves, including input and output. We can't rely on local temporary data, but we need to use a global memory retention. So writing buffer data directly into the shader is very important. So the storage buffer is essential for the compute pipeline, not just because it's big enough. We can also save the results and return it to JavaScript and share it with other pipelines. And it makes it easier for us to arrange the whole process. In this demo, what we need to do is put a large model view matrix and multiply it by a projection matrix to compute MVP matrix for each object. So how do we deal with the results from the compute pipeline? And in compute shader, we need to manage our own data. So we also have to create an equivalent size MVP buffer to save the result. Other than that, we can certainly pass on some basic parameter information to the compute shader. So it will be more convenient for us in the shader to make some computational logic in judgments. As we just said, in compute pipeline, data can only be passed through byte group. So we need to call create band group to bind our designed data. 
at the position of group zero on compute pipeline. The order can be customized according to the order in the shader. After creating the pipeline, let's see how to execute the compute pipeline. Firstly, we need to create a command encoder. To store the following steps need to be done. And we also need to create the corresponding computing channel to perform the specific computational tasks. And of course, this is an asynchronous recording operation. The GPU is not really working. After the entire command encoder is submitted, GPU performs specific tasks in sequence. Start a computational channel is uh, very simple. We could directly call the begin compute pass and leave the parameter blank just to start a computational channel. And the calling method is basically the same as the render pass. We need to set up the pipeline first to tell the GPU which prime program to run. And then we can pass the data information. But there is no set vertex buffer. So we can only pass the data through band group. We bind the just created band group at position 0. And then we can run that. But the API here is a little bit different. And we are familiar with the render pass. And here we should call the draw method. But in compute pass API, we use the dispatch workgroups. And here we are going to introduce an important point of knowledge while learning the compute pipeline. And this API should be viewed together with the parameter workgroup sites. And let's look into details. And as we know, that the draw function in render pipeline is to set how many vertex shaders are running in parallel and how many groups to run in total. And the nature of compute pipeline is also parallel computing. But in the compute pipeline, we just split these two parameters into two places. How many compute shaders run at the same time? We wrote this parameter in the shader and JavaScript only controls how many groups to run in total. If Compute Pipeline also uses dispatch group size group count method, people will be more familiar. But why does GPU split them up? Actually, this is not required by WebGPU, but the limitation of the underlying graphics API. To optimize the performance of Compute Shader, the underlying API should know exactly how many parallel threads to run while the compilation. So we can now set this program in JavaScript. And now let's look into the second point. And now let's look into the second difference. In order to meet the flexibility of calculation, Compute Pipeline set the group size and group number into three dimension x, y, z. That is to say, we just start SX, XY, SZ threads at the same time and start NX, NY, NZ groups. So we have to run the compute shader that multiplies times. And you might be confusing about three-dimensional settings. Let's think about what is the core of parallel computing. It's to split data and allocate the data equally to each GPU thread resource. For example, we split data in one dimension. And we have a million numbers. And every 10 sort numbers in a group, we divide it into 10 groups. But for image data, this is a two-dimension plane coordinates. It's inconvenient to deal with this uh, in one dimension. So it may be more suitable to divide it into two dimensions. For example, we are using a 3x3 three three grid to split the entire graph. And there may be some complex data that contains the three dimensions at the same time, such as the, the depth information. Then we could use the three dimension to divide it. So in WebGPU or Graphics API, three dimensions are designed here. Let's take a simple example to illustrate. For example, we have a 8x8 64 pixel image. And we need to split data and divide the threads. And the smallest unit is a pixel. So we can split the image into 64 separate data. And then start 64 threads to process it. But of course, you can treat the image data as a one-dimensional array. But it will be more convenient to treat it as a two dimensions. 
For example, we are using 4x4 grid here to deal with it. That is to say, we need to start 16 threads at a time. So if we would like to fully process the entire image, how many groups to run? So we can run two times in each X direction and the Y direction respectively, and then the whole image will be processed. So in the compute shader, we set group size as four and four. And in dispatch work groups, we set two times in each direct dimension. And there is a relationship between these two parameters. The bigger the group size, the less the groups. And in the contrast, if the group size is smaller, then we need more groups to run. And until now, people may ask, how do we differentiate each thread about the corresponding data and pixel coordinates? So how do we differentiate in the vertex shader which vertices or objects you are dealing with? If you remember, WebGPU will pass the built-in vertex index and instance index into the vertex entry function. And in Compute Shader, we also have such parameters, local invocation ID and global invocation ID, which indicates the index in the current group and index in the overall data. Let's take this grid as the example. The group size is 4 by 4, so its coordinates in its own local group is 1, 1. But for the overall picture, the global invocation ID should be 5, 5. You can use these two parameters to locate which pixel or data is currently being processed by the thread in the shader. And people may be curious about what if I divide it into one dimension? And what is the difference? Actually, it's just the way that data is divided is different. But it will not affect the number of parallel threads or running speed. For example, we can think of this image as a 64 consecutive numbers. And we split every 16 numbers in a group. So we need to activate four groups in one dimension. But the only difference here is how to locate the data. The first method is to use the two-dimensional coordinates and to precise the first 16 data. And the second one is to use a continuous index to locate the data. And in the compute shader, the calculation method of index will be different, but there is no essential difference. Relatively speaking, processing in one dimension will be simpler. But two-dimension and three-dimension grouping will be more suitable for graphical data. OK, let's take a look at the specific settings in the compute shader. And here we are using 128 threads and one group to divide the data. And other dimension is set to 4 to 1. And attention here, WebGPU specifics the maximum size of dimension xy is 256. And the maximum value for z is 64. So in order to process all the data, in JavaScript we need to start a number divided by 128 groups to run. But the data number could not be exactly divided by 228, so we need to do some roundup. So the total number will be greater than the actual amount of data. But the last set of data will be beyond the scope of data. So what should we do here? Actually, we just need to add a simple test to say the global ID, which indicates the index value of the whole data in various dimensions. And for one dimension grouping, it will be easy. The index will be the number of the data. If index is greater than or equal to this number, then we can just return. And for the rest of calculations, it's a simple part. We've done this many times in the vertex shader. And this is a projection matrix multiplied by the model view matrix. But the difference here is the MVP result in the compute shader need to save into the corresponding index MVP buffer. And note in the storage buffer, we need to add the read-read permission. And the default is only read permission. And so far, a complete compute pipeline has been created. After we submit in command encoder, the GPU will start parallel computing to calculate the MVP values and save it into the MVP buffer.
then how do we get the result of MVP buffer? MVP buffer here is actually a proxy object in the CPU. We can't just read the contents of GPU directly. Just like writing to the GPU buffer, we also need to use some WebGPU API. And we have introduced the Red Buffer API before. It is called by JavaScript and synchronously read to the corresponding GPU buffer. Then how about reading data? We have an API similar to synchronized read buffer in WebGL, but in modern graphics API to optimize the read and write performance especially the read performance. WebGPU do not provide the direct read operations, and we need to use the temporal buffer of GPU. And simply put, the GPU can share a common piece of video memory with the CPU, which can be operated by both CPU and GPU. And the purpose is to exchange data. And if the CPU wants to read the data, you can request a temporal cache first, and then notify the GPU to copy the target buffer into the temporary cache, and then back to the CPU. This ensures the program inside the GPU proceed efficient data manipulation, and without disturbed by the CPU read and write operations. And now let's implement it. First, we need to create a buffer to read the cache. It is just a GPU buffer, but with the usage map read, and also a copy destination type. As we said, we need to copy the GPU buffer first, and then can be read by the CPU. To read the entire contents of MVP buffer at once, it should at least the same size as MVP buffer. And of course, we can set the size according to our needs. Let's say if we just want to read a, a matrix at once, and we need to apply a mat 4x4 size, that is 64 bytes. So how to do that? Firstly, we need to tell the GPU, copy the docket buffer. This is also the basic work order. So we need to use the command encoder to add an instruction to the GPU queue. We want to wait until the calculation is complete and then make another copy. So we have to wait for the compute pass end to operate later. We can also create a new command encoder to pass this command, or use the previous command encoder. And the command is copy buffer to buffer, which has the four parameters. The first is where to copy, the second is to where to start as a bit, and then third one is uh, where copy to, and then the fourth one is the size of the copy. So this command means to put entire content of MVP copy to the read buffer. And of course, we need to declare the read buffer in advance. OK, after the command encoder is submitted, the GPU will execute the compute pipeline in order. And then do the calculations we want and then read the result into the MVP buffer. After the compute pass end, and then execute the buffer copy to buffer command. To copy the content of MVP buffer to read buffer in a temporary cache. But it's not over yet. This read buffer is essentially a GPU buffer. We have no way of reading this the contents directly. We can call another API map async to put the content of read buffer into the CPU memory. Simply put, CPU need to create a synchronized relationship between the video memory in the GPU and copy the contents of the GPU buffer to the CPU memory. At this time, CPU will have the permission control of this part video memory. WebGPU will help us synchronize the video memory content of the GPU. And in this example, we just need to read the content so we can use a read-only schema map. And this API is also a typical asynchronous operation. The underlying API will wait until the GPU has done all the calculations. The mapping relationship is established after the copy step. And then we get a CPU memory that can be operated by JavaScript. Firstly, we can use the getMappedRange API to get mapped CPU memory 
And in the web environment, this is an array buffer object. We can convert it, this array buffer into the practical array data types in JavaScript. And MVP matrix, we could use uh, the float32 array to convert. And this is the final calculation result we got. We can print it out and have a look. This is a million mat 4x4 array. Well done, but we haven't finished yet. There are two small details. After finish reading the GPU's memory, please remember to release the mapping relationship. Otherwise, the rebuffer will remain in the mapped state. And the GPU does not have the permission to operate it. If we want to use this read buffer later, we need to call read buffer and map API to release the permission on the cache. But while freeing the GPU buffer, the, GP, the array buffer we just got will be released automatically and the content will be cleared. Let's print it out. There is a value in the result before unmap, but it's been cleared after unmap API. So what can we do while free the cache and keep the result? We just need to copy the result in the JavaScript. There are many methods. For example, we can call slash to make a copy of the same float32 array. In this way, even though the original memory is freed, we can still keep the result. All right, this is a simple compute pipeline parallel computing. And the whole process by passing the result back to JavaScript. And for now, WebGPU did not provide the permission to open the time query. So we cannot detect the running time of a pipeline accurately. So usually we'll use some external parameters such as the frame rate or reading the buffer to get the uh, approximate running time. Because this map async API will run until the GPU completes the relevant calculations, so we can detect the time of map async to roughly detect the running time of GPU. And why is it a roughly time? Because the second key point here, the consumption time of map async is also very large. And the cost of installation communication and transfer data between CPU and GPU is much higher. And roughly, it is at least 30 milliseconds. And previously, we used red buffer to write a million matrix data. And it takes quite a long time. Comparing to the CPU and GPU operations, it is very expensive. Firstly, it takes some time to establish the communication relationship. Secondly, it takes time to apply for a temporary buffer zone. Thirdly, the transmission of data itself also takes time. And these three steps are very slow. So we run this demo 300 times to extend the commutation time and then flatten the transfer time consumed by map async averaged to 300 times. Actually, the calculation time we got earlier is longer than the real time. In fact, the GPU will run faster. So it brings us to the third point. For high performance GPU applications, we do not recommend to use the CPU frequently due to data exchange with GPU, especially reading and writing the big data. In theory, best program to start to create all resources in the once includes textures, models, buffer data, and other resources, but not in the rendering and the calculation process to transfer the big data. All the logic should be done independently by the GPU. We sacrifice some loading time of a certain program and video memory space, but in exchange, we have a very high performance of compute and rendering. So in practice, we rarely read the GPU buffer into JavaScript while do the calculation process. It's recommended to pass directly to the next compute pipeline or render pipeline to deal with it accordingly. This requires us to plan the data processing well in advance, the logic and the flow. And in this example, we simulate the tens and thousands of objects moving in the scene dynamically. This is a common in simulating particle effects. If you only use a CPU to calculate the position of each object, you cannot meet the hundreds of thousands requirement. So in practice, we can first use a compute pipeline to calculate the moving position of the particles. And of course, this requires the processing logic is in line with the requirements of parallel algorithms.
and we do not recommend to pass the result back to JavaScript for secondary processing because the communication between CPU and GPU is very slow. We should plan the procedure in advance. The computations can be performed in the compute pipeline. Then we put, put them all into the compute pipeline. And data shared by various pipelines through the band group. In this example, we first execute the compute pipeline and can calculate the position of each particle and then deal with the MVP matrix. And then we did directly run the render pipeline to draw each object. The data will not pass through JavaScript in the middle. We create all the buffers in pipelines and then bind the MVP buffer both in the compute pipeline and render pipeline. In the runtime, the compute pipeline will save the result in the MVP buffer, and then render pipeline can access it directly from the MVP buffer. It's all about sharing data inside a GPU. JavaScript is just a simple call flow. There is no more data transfers, but of course you can change the position of camera. But the whole logic of particle motion is written in the shader. This example is simple. We have an initial velocity, and we change the position every frame. The particle will rebound after hitting the border. The key part here is not pass the position back to the JavaScript. Instead, we modify the model view and the MVP matrix directly. Because this MVP buffer is also bind to render pipeline. So in the vertex shader of this render pipeline, we can calculate the vertex coordinates directly. All right, this is a typical compute pipeline. In the real projects, it may require dozens or even hundreds of compute pipelines in series. For example, to simulate some complex physical process. But we also use the storage buffer to share data between the pipelines. CPU is only responsible for the control of the process or mouse or the keyboard interaction. All right, that is all for today's tutorial. Please feel free to download the GitHub repo and then run the examples. This is also the last video in our WebGPU fundamental tutorial series. Thank you for your attention and company over the past few months. Our Evolution Web GPU engine is about to be published. We'll introduce how to use our engine. Welcome to subscribe our channel, and I'll see you next time.